Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me on another edition of the Richard Listens Show. I'm uh, thank, thankful to my sponsor, Injitsu and Impact Dental Designs, and I thank all of you for supporting us over the years and in our current incarnation and from our current vantage point uh, underneath my lemon tree uh, as we adjust to current life beyond quarantine uh, and thank you again uh, for always being there for for being a part of what matters to you speaking your mind uh, whether it be social issues or just in sharing your journey and being authentic again I'm Richard Olberger clinical psychologist here as a resource to you please reach out to me at richardlistens.com if you or someone you know are in need of support whether it be consulting coaching or performance or clinical psychology. That's a mouthful. Again, Richard Listens. Check me out on Instagram at Richard Listens or patreon.com slash Richard Listens. You get the theme. I'm excited to bring to you today my guest, uh, who is Sarah Saul. Uh, she is a Maccabi USA alumni, and she is also working with rugby for Maccabi USA. Uh, she's a background uh, high-level rugby athlete and she made a pivot after a career-ending injury. She had multiple surgeries and ultimately a knee replacement and she's also a member she was a member of the U.S. Olympic rugby team. She'll be the first person in North America to receive a professional certification from the University of England. She's very passionate about working with physical health and expanded her skill set to work with overall elite athlete well-being. She's passionate about her work, and I think you're going to be excited to meet her. I know I am ready to have this conversation. Without further ado, I welcome Sarah Saul. Welcome to the show, Sarah Saul. Well, thank you. Hello, how are you? Thank you, and thank you. It's been an awesome gift uh, being introduced to you through uh, Maccabi USA after doing a presentation there about a month ago, and, and you've been peppering me with introduction, <laughs> introductions to athletes and uh, educators and, and elite well-being. Uh, you are a well-resourced individual. I know. I, I think I've been uh, networking my whole life without actually knowing I was networking. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it just part of your personality? Is it part of being an athlete? Um, where does it start um, for you? I think, I don't know, I think it's part of my personality, just getting to know people. Um, but it, it's also, I think, because I was always kind of working with the team. So you kind of have to, you know, you, you know who's important. Like um, I was doing this networking conference, and they were saying how you should always introduce yourself to the CEO. And I said, well, so it was with Cap Gemini actually. And I said, well, the first person I introduce myself when I go with a team is the people in the, people in the kitchen staff, because they're the people that help me the most. Because <laughs> when in the medical staff, I would make you know I'd have to make Gatorade and use luggage carts, and all of that stuff adds up. So those are the people that like get you the most information <laughs> and can help you like the ceo just kind of comes in as a figurehead and doesn't really do anything so that's a good tip the kitchen yeah. staff yeah i always share I, I always share the story um so if my listeners have heard it before uh they'll have to forgive me how i was tra when i traveled cross country i stopped at a it was the the speech to set off the year for a mba program I think it was a uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And my cousin was driving and he was very resourceful. We, re we really just wanted to see the basketball court and maybe get a drink of water yeah. and get out of the heat. And so there was an area in the back of the gym and there was some lemonade set out and some snack wells cookies or something. So we helped ourselves to a, a snack and we just kind of, you know, hopped back in, in the back of the gym and just they, you know, all the students filed in and all the excitement of people meeting each other. And then the keynote speaker came to the front. And so, I mean, I was just soaking it all up. It was like, you know, we were just probably just wanting to get an hour rest, but he pretty much said, you know, similar things. Like I saw him during a break, walk around and introduce himself to every single student and then came back and introduced himself to us. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I was honest. I said, we're just here listening in. And he, he didn't treat us any differently. And it's a very powerful stance to take, you know, when you're friendly with everybody in an organization and, and you know the inner workings. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about that because um, where I grew up, like where the Maccabia kind of is outside Philadelphia, and I grew up riding horses. So it's a very, at the top level, it's a very elite sport with a lot of money, mm -hmm. with a lot of ridiculous people, a lot of great people, but a lot of privileged people. And so I think I learned early on that it didn't really, you know, money didn't really impress me. And then I've been lucky to work with such high level athletes, you know, rugby in the US isn't necessarily where it is in terms to other countries, but some of our athletes are to them superstars. But so to me, I don't care, you know, I don't care if you're, you know, the Michael Jordan of rugby or whomever, because I'm around all of these like wonderful people anyway. So it, it, the the elite level or the high level or the money aspect doesn't bother me and I find people like it better when you treat them the same like uh, I worked for a Campbell Soup woman when I trained horses and everybody just kind of like um, you know was like oh Mary Alice Mary Alice and would do all this stuff and I was just like oh how was your day you know like how are your daughters doing and I talked to her like a normal person and I think she appreciated that because so many people treat you so differently and are just looking for you know, looking for things from you, I guess, that, again, I, I judge people after how they treat other people. So, you know, I really. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I know they showed uh, in Michael Jordan's The Last Dance, you know, how uh, he kind of looked forward and planned for becoming a baseball player after his first retirement. And how, you know, people really suspected that he would just flame out. And he really relished being just a member of a minor league team you know, running around, horsing around with them. And, yeah. and, and you could see that he created that energy because they, they probably looked to him to see how he wanted to be treated. Um, I guess similar lines, like, so at the Rio Olympics, we, we trained next to the basketball team. And so like, you know, our guys were like, you know, so excited. And we, we arranged it so that we went over to one of their trainings. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, th I think it's probably common knowledge that they stayed on like a cruise ship or something. They didn't stay in the athlete's village. So for them to be around normal people in like the opening ceremonies, like it was the most exciting thing to be just kind of normal and be there with the rest of the athletes because they're used to being by themselves and isolated. So for our guys to just kind of like mingle in and hang out with them and for that, you could tell at opening ceremonies that they just liked being treated like everybody else. Yeah. So, you know, but you are not everybody else. You are a tremendous influencer and athlete. Uh, and currently you, you just started a company uh, called Tori. Um, tell us a little bit about, about that. Um, well, it started as a kind of like a visual resume because I'm a kind of jack of all trades. You know, because rugby, you know, we just became professional in the States. So, I started in the medical um, field and I became a manager. I, I do photography and I'm studying elite athlete well being right now. Um, and I want to do player promotion. So um, I kind of I decided I wanted to do a website to kind of like encompass all of these things and I couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, and one of my friends introduced me as a rugby influencer. <laughs> <laughs> to somebody which I was like uh, what do I sell things on Instagram and then I kind of you were like I don't know if I want that intro yeah, yeah. But, like, <laughs> sell things off Amazon but it was funny and I started laughing about it and telling people and you know my whole thing is kind of like presenting things and the stuff like you're doing like like you know basically gut health and and player well-being and, and stuff that's not new but newer um, and a lot of rugby stuff is regurgitated and like you know still even at the Olympic Training Center they talk about the food pyramid like that being how you eat and so you know just kind of like presenting ways and to influence people's thought process but again not tell them that they're wrong or they're right because I think so many people have different theories and yeah, it doesn't mean my theory is right or your theory is right, but so we kind of took the term influence and a friend of mine, you know, we made it into ways where we can kind of like 
say, you're not wrong, but we'd like to influence your thoughts in this way and also show showcase what athletes are doing, like, you know, especially now, like good in the world and, you know, project that they're doing or businesses that they're doing and, you know, just kind of present relevant information because a lot of the times that people have new and different thought processes, they're, they're not really good at promoting themselves um, to do that. So I kind of wanted to give a whole showcase for that. And again, the elite athlete well-being part is a, is a huge thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you are, you know, you go from being around horses to playing rugby. How did you start out <laughs> getting into right this is this is this every young girl's dream when she puts down her bar barbie dolls or like uh, i mean <laughs> I, I wasn't allowed to play with barbies when i was young i was not allowed my mom gave me one when i graduated from college and said i think you can um that was the one funny thing she did she's like i think you're old enough to like like handle this now because she didn't like what barbies represented when i was young uh. Um, no, I, I mean, I didn't want to go to school. I just wanted to ride horses. And I, I learned very quickly that I was not good enough, that I, w I went to the top level, but um, I was never going to make the Olympics. And I didn't have the funding to be at that level. Like, I, I, I mean, I still could have done it at a lower level. And I continued through college and after college. But I started playing rugby more as a social thing. Um, cause I kept a horse through college and I competed, but I didn't want to join the equestrian team. And so my brother had played rugby in college, but it wasn't that common. And then one of my friends said, do you want to play rugby? And I was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, I didn't really, you know, I played some tennis. And <laughs> What percentage of college teams have uh, rugby in the U.S.? Oh, I mean, all, now almost every college has a team. I mean, it's still, there are some NCAA programs and a lot of my friends coach them. Um, but basically, it kind of like how ice hockey, uh, almost every almost every college has a team. Um, and they're, you know, kind of like a step above club. And then some are funded um, through alumni, some are NCAA. It, it kind of varies. I mean, now I started a girls high school program right after college. There was boys high school when I was in school, when high school, but there wasn't girls. But now, I mean, now there's youth. But I mean, it, it's really almost everywhere. You just probably don't know that it's there. If you seek it out. Mm -hmm. And you were explaining, so there are the sevens, and then there's the fifteens. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. So I'm learning. So um, is that just depend on the area you're from or the country you're from? Or what is the... Well, I've learned there's like, there's tons and tons of different versions, but the two predominant ones are uh, Rugby Union, which is 15s, which is like um, the mecca of rugby. So it's 15 people aside. It's what you watch on television. Um, it's 80 minute, you know, a little bit more like soccer, like 80 minute games. And so we won the gold medal in 1920 and 1924, but the games are... Um, you know, 80 minutes long. So the, our World Cups are like soccer World Cups. It's two months long. And the, you have to have a, like a week in between games for recovery. Sometimes they do four days, but you really need a week. Uh, sevens is like an abridged version, which the coach of the U.S. put it put it really well. He's like, it's not to compete. Some people used to think it was like a training for 15s. Um, but it's not to compete, it's to complement. So it's almost, it's similar principles, but it's seven people aside, seven minute halves, which sounds, you know, not, you know, people are like, oh, well, that sounds easy. But it's the same size pitch, which is bigger than a football field. And it's just, you know, the same as a soccer pitch. So it's a lot more open space. It's a lot more, I should say, Americanized. And that's what's in the Olympics. So the World Cup, um, which again, you grow up and it's you know, soccer World Cup, Summer Olympics, Rugby World Cup. And when we were young, they just put, uh, they just put Rugby Sevens in the Rio Olympics, but they put it in 2019. So you didn't grow up saying, oh, I wanted to be an Olympic rugby player. So it was always, you know, World Cup, that was your, that was your shining star. 
But then once they added that to the Olympics, it kind of changed the game a little bit and made it more that sevens um, kind of stood out more. I mean, some places in the world, some people still are like, oh, that's not really a sport, even though it's, to me, I think it's much more physically demanding. And it's, it's, um, it's a very honest game because you have seven on seven, same size field, whereas you would have 30 people on the field. And so you make a mistake and it's, someone scores. So, you know, you miss a tackle in 15s, you have 14 other people there, you know, there's lots of different phases. Here, you know, you miss a tackle and most likely they're scoring off of that. There's no taking so, a playoff. <laughs> right, so it's, it's, like, it's like amplified. So, uh, you know, every single ma mistake you make is put on the big screen over and over and over again. And you travel, the World Series of Sevens, you travel with 16 different countries. So it's like our, our own Olympic village. So the top 16 teams travel and we go to 10 different countries every year, except this year. <laughs> wow. um, so you travel around and you eat, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You stay at the same hotels. We call it a traveling cir circus. The referees <laughs> are there. The announcers are there. The production staff is there. It's, I mean, it's really cool. So you're around 16 cultures and, you know, it's a little difficult for the players because they have to compete against them. But um, it's great for staff because you get to be around so many different people. That's a good point. Although you were explaining to me that it's a little bit, it does foster a certain camaraderie. I mean, these are your opponents, but you're also in it together. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, if you're in the training room or if you're in recovery, um, how do you balance that out? The, the kind of global, global message and mission of the sport with <laughs> I want I want to I, I gotta I'm gonna fight you for every inch yeah you know again because in 15s like you if we're say we're playing Canada you stay in a separate hotel you don't you don't train at the same facility I mean World Cups we have guards so that people aren't you know watching <laughs> our practices and then we go to sevens and I'm like well if you have an injury they can you know everybody can see it if they're taped up they see if you come in in the morning, like if you're not feeling well and you just don't look like you have a lot of energy, like if you're not dressed similar. Um, I, you know, I think, and I'm just talking from a men's perspective because I worked on the men's series. I mean, it's the same for the women, but I'm using the term boys because I work with men. Um, for the boys, I mean, I think once they played for a while, they, they, they end up respecting each other and they become friends and they know how to make that difference. But in the beginning, I think it's very difficult because you are playing at the highest level competing against these people. I mean, they're playing against each other in the Olympics, but yet you have to live with them and travel with them. And a lot, a lot of times you scrimmage with them during the week. And so it's kind of hard to keep, you, know, you can't keep your place secret. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic because you always have to be on because you're always being judged. So even though I say I have lots of friends on the series from different staff, it's still they're always judging you because that's what it is. I mean, we're at the highest level. It's... So you've played at the highest level. Now you're taking it, you know, um, to the, the extreme of providing healing. You, you've gained certifications, it looks like, in numerous types of uh, sports therapy and corrective muscle therapy. Um, what is your vision for, for rugby and for healing uh, and, and your role now that you've left as an athlete and you're redefining the stance um, you take? Well, like with the body work and, and nutrition and that kind of stuff, I mean, it's just, it's more about, um, you know, focusing more on recovery and and better nutrition habits and, and just, you know, basically being a, overall a better athlete and better training. Um, but the elite athlete well-being part is something that we don't really have in the States that much, which I've learned that almost every other country. And it's, I guess it's a lot of it along, you know, along the lines of what you do, but basically, you know, taking all the elements of what athletes care about and you know number one caring about them so caring what their purpose in life is and what their values are and what their goals are and what their family life is like um especially in the u.s because you know our like our teams are made up of i mean they're all americans but 
people from Tongan descent and Fijian descent and English descent and, you know, American Samoan descent and, you know, Californian descent. So we have so many different cultures that it's understanding our culture so you can understand all these other cultures. So taking all of these elements and actually caring about a person and then as an athlete and not just as a body. And then once you care about them, that makes them a better person, which is the ultimate goal. And then that makes your organization stronger because it makes them a stronger person. And then, you know, it helps, it goes into ways of why that helps an organization with player retention and just, you know, player culture and team culture. But it's really something I think like a lot of teams have aspects of it, but we don't have wellness people built in. Like I've heard of a few people in teams, but I, you know, I'm taking this certification that's um, with a lot of premiership football or soccer players, you know, a lot of the top clubs, and they all have wellness specialists in in the UK. Yeah, in in their sports teams, and same in Australia. And it's crazy to me. Like, it's great that the, that that's what they do is that they're there to take care of the athletes. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Even myself as a sports psychologist, that you can sense the fear from like a American football or any kind of, you know, sport where you need to be physically strong and dominant, where it's almost like there's a fear that if you tap into well-being or the whole human, that they'll lose their killer edge. They'll lose that instinct that that's been in them to, you know, fight and, and defeat your opponent um you know at all costs so what's being done to like right because this is a it, it seems intuitive that treating the whole human being and making the athlete feel valued and understood and connected to as a human being and helping them to do that for themselves would be what would pr propel a team and a sport forward yeah i mean i think it depends you know and i'm you know I'm not as well versed on other sports but i think it depends on the culture of the sport and so like as a rugby player your career lasts longer so you know i would say in the nfl where you're worried about getting trade you know you could be traded or cut at any point i mean which i mean is the same in rugby you could be injured but the average what's the is it two and a half years the average nfl player career. I think, sounds sounds less than three yeah sounds right you know, so your your stake in that team probably isn't as high if you know that your turnover is going to be quick. Like, this is kind of an aside example. One of the things we did was on the premiership soccer coaches that the average career is a year, a year and a quarter. For so, coaches. Yeah, for the coaches. So we were supposed to develop a plan of like how to help them transition. So it's like, but how do you help somebody buy in when I think the average age was like 41 that you become a coach. So you've been, you make a plan your whole life to become a premiership soccer coach, but knowing that the average is that you're only gonna be there a year. So how do you buy into that organization if you don't think you're gonna be there that long? Like, why would you care? So to me, they have to kind of look at, you know, what, what they're doing as coach development and why the turnover is so big. But, um, you know, as far as rugby, it's like, well, in other sports, it's if you, I mean, yeah, you're, you're worried about getting cut all the time. If you're just worried about being a player and making a wrong move, then you're not focusing and you're not relaxing and you're not in that zone. But like you said, I think it's difficult because a lot of the subjects we talk about of what makes you an elite athlete and at that high level, it's kind of like you don't want it to take, it's like on the edge of what makes you overdo it too much. Right, right. The ability to like, right, ne never let your guard down or, you know, the stories um, reading uh, Relentless by Tim Grover and uh, sharing about Michael Jordan or, you know, different athletes that call him in the middle of the night in between a final series when they had a poor game, right, about having to regain that edge that says, like, it would be easy to say, I'm going to a surgery in the offseason, like, I can't play the next game or the rest of the series. 
but you know, right. If, for these mm-hmm. athletes, like with the Olympics, like, oh yeah, it's easy to say, oh yeah, just next year. You know, so, I mean, for some of these people, that's been their dream their entire life. Not everybody goes to one or two Olympics. So if you have been, you know, putting off things in your life and dedicating time and just to say, oh, well now relax, <laughs> you know, like use this time as a rest and relaxation period. But you're used to training. Um, and I was just talking to my good friend who's like my yoga instructor. I just did a, a talk with her and we were talking about the importance, you know, of relaxing and just doing that. And I, I said, I think for athletes and for myself, that's really tough because you don't feel like you have control. Like you feel like if you're not, when you're resting, that even though that's something super important for you to do, that you're not doing anything, so you're not controlling anything, even though you are controlling, but it, it's hard for me, myself, to sit and do nothing, because I'm like, well, I could be training, I could be, you know, I could be doing this, I could be studying this, but you don't understand the importance of relaxing. Yeah, and it's it's tough to learn the experience that it's counterintuitive, right, that by being still or using mindfulness training, you know, that, that by, or even recovery, that by, that you're actually, your muscles need time to grow, you know, for you to operate at that capacity of your workload and strength, you need the recovery and rest time. And yet, right, because if you're elite and if you've done it for so long, you're just used to keep pushing harder and harder and harder. Um, so the importance of working with, you know, health professionals that are that are on your side that are, you know, going to tell you when you can give more and when you need to go beyond and push yourself to greater limits to keep growing and when you need to flip the switch and allow in for some of this recovery, some of the visualization, imagery training, other things you can do while you heal and rest and connect to other parts of yourself as a human being because you know you know the flip side of it is right number one we don't understand when you talk about um you know the nervous system and and autoimmune right and your long-term health if you are constantly pulling the lever towards overdrive what are you doing to the engine and so looking at like you said having functional medicine involved having people who look at your long-term health and i know it's hard to say that you know, easy for me to say as an armchair uh, podcast host compared to if I was getting paid millions of dollars to play in that one more season and my family and my crew depended on it. So we know there's extremes out there, but on some level, beginning to educate yourself about are there moments when you can slow this down? And if it's, even if it's a, you know, an elite athlete or a doctor serving hundreds of people with the coronavirus, my goal is to help them find moments Maybe it's moments where you can shift the off button. They have to be there. Um, You know, we've seen, you know, elite skiers that that, that just those few minutes up at the top of the ramp where you could have a relationship to yourself and your breath and the thoughts, right? Like nobody knows what you're doing up there, that it's not part of your preparation routine, you know, they, right? So there's ways to extend moments that seem like an eternity to you probably as an athlete, but that allow you a little bit of time to breathe, reset, um, and just recenter yourself if possible. Uh, so yeah. Part of the educational process of it too, is that we don't educate the athletes enough because they're kind of used to being, doing what they're told, you know, like they don't really, you know, I have some athletes who really do research and think about things and, and know their bodies and know, and then others that are just, they do whatever you tell them to do. So they- If it's a team culture, right? I mean, we <laughs> referencing all my quarantine watching, but they had Lamstrong, Lance Armstrong on the 30 for 30. And it wasn't just him, like half the players, the, the writers said, oh yeah, if you wanted to be on this team, you needed to uh, take a, a performance enhancer. Like, if that's your introduction to your sport, into belonging, into competition, then what? Are you, how are you supposed to think about yourself and your health and your performance, you know, if every other guy can go 10 times faster? Right. So you're not going to be thinking about, right, how to take care of yourself. You're going to be thinking about every advantage chemically. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully assuming, right, 
that all things are being being equal and that you're willing to let other people make the choices they make about their own, you know, if they want to sacrifice their long-term health and violate the rules of a sporting organization, then that's on them. But if you want to be coming from this place of elite well-being, then, you know, understanding what you need as a human being to feel connected, where do you get your sense of, you know, connection to others or yourself, you know, who are you outside of your sporting domain? Yeah, and, uh, I'm lucky that, our, you know, our head coach for sevens, he, Mike was very big into that, you know, so the, in our program, the boys, part of their contracts is they had to do some internships or, you know, do some schooling or, or on different off seasons, they, they would have to do something to define themselves, not just as athletes. So that's great seeing some of them have done like apparel lines and some of them have done other things, but you know, that, uh, that's again, knowing that it's okay to think of myself as not as like an entity and that I can do other things and that I need to think about my life outside of rugby. But you're right, I mean, that comes from the culture. And again, we're lucky where rugby is a skill-based sport and it, there's really, the culture is, I mean, there's hardly any cases of a drug use in it. It's just again it's just not in the culture and because it's skill based it's you know especially in the US where we don't we weren't brought up with a rugby ball in our hands it's very much you're developed as an athlete so it takes you know a couple years for you well a long time for you to develop that skill so you're not in or in and in or out like it's very hard for crossover athletes like we've had a bunch of NFL players that have tried and they just can't do it. I mean, they're incredible athletes, but it's just the skill set and the the thinking off the cuff and not being told, you know, because rugby's continuous. We do have plays, but it's not as scripted as the NFL. What are those skill sets? What are the skills that are developed as a as a young rugby a lot player? Of ball handling. So, like our, our U.S. sevens team, we used to be like when I started with them and our head coaches. Five years ago, they were we were 13th in the world out of 16 teams on the series, and we were going to get relegated. And I mean, they're amazing athletes, but the coach came in, and basically, when I saw that, I was like, oh, well, they can catch and pass, and they they had the correct fitness. Like they had always been fit, but this coach knew how to teach them how to work their bodies correctly and how to and they brought me on like I was one of the only body workers on the series that was like full time or the only one because he was very big on recovery and he knew how important recovery was for an athlete so but basically I mean it's it's a lot of just catching and passing like you know people always ask me oh what do the national teams do I'm like they do the same drills that you know your high school team does like they do them even more like they don't make them complicated they just drill it into them so that their skill sets are so good that they can make other decisions so that when they're giving options they can choose their lines of running you know and they they can think about things and they I mean they do so much film work but it's analyzing what to do um but yeah I mean it's it's basic you know it's interesting because it's basic stuff and a lot of I've seen a lot of club teams make it so much more complicated than than it is. I mean, it's really, they call rugby, it's kind of like a game of chess because you're reacting to what's happening and, and it's continuous. There's no timeouts. So. <laughs> so how do you get, how do you practice catching while someone's about to <laughs> run into you like a brick wall? I mean, that's I pretty silly. I, you know, well, <laughs> it's, it's my class, I, there's no muscle memory, it's brain memory, right? So it's just by re repetitive, you know, like the the U.S. The, they do passing drills for like 20 minutes, like before every practice, and that's something like my team when I played, we'd always complain about. But I'm like, well, that's you know, they're doing it, and they're Olympic level athletes because they just, you know, have to get that down. So it's such a fine science that when, I mean, like anything, when you're under pressure, it just comes automatically. That's right, and you mentioned you know brain science and brain health. Um, obviously it's become a big issue in the United States about, uh, brain, you know, concussions and, um, 
I know that, uh, you know, it's, it's common in rugby as well. Uh, what's being done to, to track and treat uh, brain injuries? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, I, I'm lucky that, again, be, traveling on the seven series, you're around the top people from so many different countries. So the top people in South Africa, the top people in New Zealand, the top people in Australia and England. So you kind of it's it's great because you get the information firsthand. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know all the statistics offhand, but there's so many there's so many less injury head injuries in rugby than there are in football or lacrosse or any other sport. And any of my friends that have played football, American football or rugby say that because first of all, with a helmet, you don't, there's a false sense of security that you can ram your head into it. There's also, so like I'm 5'3". I mean, I'm not as muscular as I was before, but I would play against women like three times my size. So I would never like go ram my head into into somebody so like wrestlers make really good rugby players because it's a lot of skill and technique and it's a lot of single leg takedowns basically is what makes a good tackle like so if i tried to tackle a woman you know that that's six feet tall and weighs 50 pounds you know 50 or 60 pounds more than me if i go to try to go around her shoulders i mean they're just going to drag me around so you want to go low and take them down and there's things about rugby tackling where you can't leave your feet, you have to wrap, um, you can't just shoulder check somebody. So, and, and you have to bring them down, you can't spear tackle, like you can't bring them up and down. So the tackling's a lot safer. And so, you know, you're always pu- taught to put your head to the side and your shoulder to the side. And again, like a wrestler, take them down. But again, cause the game is continuous, but you also learn how to get tackled and that's being part of the game. So you learn how, like if you're, if you're getting tackled and you get don't down. Know, it's like how to present your body and like how to go into a tackle and you know position your body so it sets it sets the ball up in position for you know for your team so there's a lot of different elements but yeah you can't like i can't leap off my feet and like ram myself into somebody so that you know the injuries are more and it's a lot of controlled you know off the base of things like you know, I think you see more like sh- shoulder injuries and head injuries when it's a, an open field tackle and it's kind of, you know, you're bringing someone down that's running really fast. But if it's something off the base of something and controlled, um, you know, it's just you see so many less injuries. But they, I mean, now they have, you know, I forget what it used to be, but they, the HIA, the head injury assessment, um, yeah, they have the referees watching, the sideline referees watching, people watching film. So basically anybody can take somebody off at any any point. And now they made it a mandatory, they keep changing, but if they suspect something, it's a mandatory 10 minutes that you're off where they'll go, you know, um, do testing off your baseline. Can you substitute in that time or is it like you play a man down or a woman um, down? You, yeah, you can substitute. Um, but if you take, um, so yeah, there's different, like there's different laws in in rugby about how many substitutions, but in 15s where games, 80 minutes, you take someone out for 10 minutes. It's not as big, big of a deal in sevens. You take someone out. I mean, that's basically the game. So there have been times where they're, I don't, I don't want to say the word overcautious, but where they have made mistakes where it kind of looks like something and and it hasn't been and it, you know, it does change the game, but I guess, you know, you have to look at the bigger picture and safety is the number one concern. And again, the culture of rugby is we want our players there for the long run. So we'd much rather, you know, we want them there for years and years because it takes years to develop. So we're not looking for a two year turnover of our, players because we just don't have that many players, <laughs> you know, and it takes that long to develop skill sets where in the NFL, they're kind of more disposable. And um, so we're lucky that we really, not to say that they don't in the NFL, but really care about long-term safety of our players. 
because we want them there. Yeah. And I can't speak for the NFL, but I know in Major League Baseball, the mental health, mental skills coaches we've had on the show have said that the farm systems, uh, the, the minor leagues is where players do a lot of the mental skills work. You know, if you get to the major league where it's cutthroat and you could be sent down, you know, that, you know, it's really hard to start applying these skills then. So I'm glad that, that rugby has this developmental culture where you're creating some security for the player, for them to buy in, invest, and trust. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's different because it, it's great now. The Sevens is the Olympics, so they're a full-time program. So they're in Chula Vista, and, they, you know, they're there every day. Um, our 15s program, which is, again, what's in the World Cup, is a little different. Now they, they're playing more before they – we used to have to send our players overseas. Now we have a major league rugby, like our um, our own professional co competition in the States. But before we'd have to send our guys overseas to get any good quality of play. And then basically we just play June test matches, like international ma matches in November. So you get some consistency and then you get sent away again. And then you won't, you wouldn't play with your, those guys. So, you know, you, you're, there, there wasn't as much security that you were going to stay in the program because you just didn't get as many chances to play. Right. So what's next for you, uh, Sarah, in our, in our closing time here? Uh, you know, if, you know, being a woman in, U in U.S. men's rugby, uh, you know, what's it like and, and, you know, what's the pathway forward? Um, well, I got, I've been in it for so long. I mean, I worked really hard that, I mean, I, I, I probably have a hundred brothers. <laughs> I, say, I, I say all the boys. You got a lot of protection on the schoolyard. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, it, um, it's great. Cause I've, I mean, I've gotten a chance to know all of the families. So, um, you know, I'm friends with players that I worked with 10 years ago. Um, so, I mean, I learned early on about being the only female, um, which, it, you know, I, I, I honestly don't mind because I'm there to observe and to help. Um, but for now, I mean, what I would like to do is now that, you know, a lot, it, it's really cool seeing a lot of the players that I work with now coaching or being, you know, GMs of these professional teams. So I like the idea of bringing um, elite athlete well-being to like major league rugby as a whole and working with everybody. Um, Cause I'm kind of like, I support everybody now or, you know, using it with the world series rather than just one individual team. Cause I don't think we're at a point yet where every team, we just don't have the resources or the money in the sport to have a well being specialist in each team. But so I would kind of like to work with all of them to try to develop that eventually we can do that. Is that the that's the vision for the future to have elite well being, being you know implemented and practiced? Yeah, I mean, it would, I mean, it would be great if we could get to that point, which I think we can. Again, with major league rugby starting, it's just it's it. You know, the the money in rugby compared to what it is for the other sports is is nothing. So it, it's just hard to have that on staff. So you've always kind of had to have twenty different hats. So to have one person do that, which is just not really realistic, but. It would have uh, to be a training that's provided to existing yeah. staff. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, there's just so much that you have to learn, um, but you know, I'm not a sports psychologist, but I have to know some of that. I'm not a nutritionalist, but it's just, there's so many different elements of it. And in the States, it's a little different because of our healthcare system as well, you know, we don't have all of these people on staff readily available. So it's also who's paying for these, these services. So. Right. It's different in the UK. Yeah. Well, yeah, because they it's have socialized. Like, yeah. So, you know, they, I mean, they get, uh, you know, I don't know if specifically sports psychology, but they, they have more resources available to them. Yeah. The slightly different terms, performance consultants or, uh, skills, mental skills coaches. 
Well, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, in my class with the Premiership football, I mean, you know, they're paying the money that they have. You know, it's I guess it's still not NFL money, but it's you know, like ten times the amount of money we have. So. So hopefully that'll change. Yeah, but I think you know, again, the culture within rugby is that they people really do care about their players. So it's just about having enough time and enough resources. So. Are they open for, for other women to join the ranks? I mean, you've made it into a band of 100 brothers, but is there stigma there or yeah, sensitivity yeah. around? My friend, um, yeah, they're open. It's just, it's just kind of, again, still kind of um, like premiership rugby and, you know, and, and world rugby is a very European, very, you know, men in suits, you know, that I will like, but it's still, you know, it's who you know and what you're used to and it, it's it's a network of people but it's starting to like one of my friends uh, this girl tiff who played for the u.s and she was one of the or the first women's major league um assistant coach for new york team rooney and um she coaches some colleges in new york and she played for the u.s she's originally from new zealand and she's wonderful and then dallas just started a team and they have their GM, I forget where the woman's from, but it's the first woman GM. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And how about, you know, just in terms of diversity, how is rugby? Is it, you know, making sure that it represents people from all cultures? I know historically, you know, uh, you know, I've seen the information on the New Zealand on the all blacks. I mean, tremendous trib tributes to culture, but is that coming into the U S scene? Yeah, I mean, you have, um, you know, one of the strongest college programs is Cal, but you have, like, on the West Coast and in Utah, like, there's a lot of Polynesian descent. Um, so, like, I would say, you know, on our U.S. Sevens team, I mean, we have, again, they're all Americans, but guys from Tongan descent, Fijian descent, um, American Samoan descent, uh, you know, from Hawaii, um, one guy that was from Japan. So, I mean, we really, which is makes it much more difficult um, to coach because you have all these different cultures. So that's why this athlete well-being is really cool because, again, it's about understanding your old culture, but they all have different ways they need to be coached. Like mm -hmm. different different learning styles, I guess. So it makes it very different from a team like the Kenyans who I love, who are so smart and they're so witty. And I, I call them the trouble team because they're just, they're always like coming up with tricks, but they have very similar upbringings. Like mm -hmm. they might all have harder upbringings where the Fijians, you know, that won the gold medal have, you know, grew up with nothing and, but they all have similar backgrounds and that makes it very easy or easier to coach if you understand that than saying have like two English kids that might have a little bit more privilege. Yeah, with with diversity goes a lot more work that has to be done to communicate and understand one another and what your motivations are. And yeah, because what... it's like the same thing. Their motivations are all very different. Like a Polynesian motivation is very different from like, you know, we have like one or two rah-rah American football types that you know you can you can yell at and that's what motivates them you yell at some other players and you've lost you've lost them <laughs> and um you know one of the players that i'm introducing you to he has you know he has his own motivation because his comes from a track background so that's more of a individual sport and so come going to a team sport is very different for him because he's been used to thinking about himself and his training and so it took him a little bit of time to to learn. So yeah, I mean, diversity is amazing and it's wonderful. And it's why I travel so much and why I love the seven series because I can wake up and Fiji singing in the morning and the Kenyans are dancing and then the Welsh are playing Tom Jones in the locker room and, and you get to experience all these different things, but it's also, you know, meshing that together is you, is very difficult. Um, yeah.
<laughs> well, they're lucky to have you there and to be focusing on elite well-being and uh, the fact you're, um, you know, connecting us to, to schools that have training programs. I know they were cut short based on Corona uh, in terms of expanding into the U.S., but the fact that they are located in Australia with rugby and in the U.K., um, uh, so, uh, you know, shout out to elite well-being scales and the elite, is it, what's the name of the school? Um, so it's this guy, Steve Johnson, the well-being science Institute. And so I'm um, actually like, we're doing, um, follow-up calls. So I think I always say the Americans spoil everything. <laughs> I'm the only American <laughs> taking this. So we're doing the, um, we did the third week on zoom and they did it. I think I was doing it at six in the morning, but now we're doing this an hour every week. And so it's a, for me, it's at three thirty in the morning. Oh, great. In Australia. <laughs> yeah. And everybody else is in the UK. So I'm like, yeah, oh, it's the mayor. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 they want to bring it to the U S but I think this has shifted them back a little bit, but I think it's, it's just so needed. And it's yes. Like, well, hopefully technology and the focus that we're bringing right now from being in this quarantine period will help us deliver this content sooner rather than later, even though uh, we'd love for it to be face to face. Uh, if we must make do with Zoom and Google Meet, yeah. we will we will do it. We will do it elite athlete style getting it yeah and that's you know it's that's the one beautiful thing is that you can reach people across the globe. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. It is. It is, even though you're stuck to a computer. At least you get to be outside, though. <laughs> I took your podcast outside. I'm going back inside for the next one. Yeah. And that's only because there's no, yeah, thankfully, the one beauty of the quarantine was it slowed down all the traffic in the trucks. But they're trying to make a comeback. Yeah. Yeah. So in closing, just tell people how to reach you and uh, how to get a hold of you uh, for any questions yeah. and to uh, support your, your work. My new site is Tori, which is T-O-R-I, rugby.com. And then I'm, you know, on all social media, Sarah Saul, S-A-L-L. -L, and um, or I can send a link to you. And then, you know, the Elite Athlete Wellbeing is through the Wellbeing Science Institute. Um, and, yeah. yeah. Well, you're a fountain of knowledge and experience pushing the envelope uh, of our listeners to get a hold and learn a little bit about rugby and certainly not to set limitations based on stature. Uh, you know, and, and if you're interested and you're willing to put yourself to the test, uh, you too, young lady, can go and embark on a career in rugby. So thank you for, uh, for being here with us today. And uh, it's a real pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. Well, that was amazing and gifted conversation with Sarah Saul of U.S. Rugby. Um, if you never had the dream before or felt the limitation, you too can compete at a high level as a woman in rugby and play internationally and also be there on the front lines with men's teams. So uh, great tips on well-being, full athlete well-being, brain health, uh, a little bit on the history and different types of rugby and precious contributions that Sarah Saul brought us today. So thanks again to all my listeners. Again, check me out on Instagram at Richard Listens or patreon.com slash Richard Listens. Support the show. We greatly appreciate it. We can't do it without you and to get advanced content. Thank you again to our sponsors, Impact Dental Designs and Injitsu, where you can get a workout with an MMA champion and then get to talk to them about it after. Take care, everybody. I'm Richard Listens and I'm out.